بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ان شاء الله تعالى ان keep it short ان شاء الله تعالى just wanted to mention i wanted to begin by mentioning something that uh, i heard from one of my uh, senior teachers recently uh, i thought it was um, extremely important and extremely relevant uh, for our situation. Um, he said that uh, Ibn Ata'illah al-Sakandari, who was a, a great uh, mystic, he was a great scholar, uh, Egyptian scholar, uh, he experienced a bit of a, a spiritual crisis during a time in his life. And spiritual crises are something that are quite common actually. And um, it affects a lot of people, and sometimes they're minor, just a few issues, or even one issue that bothers people, and sometimes they're major, right? Uh, one of my colleagues uh, told me recently that he spent three or four hours on the phone one time uh, convincing a hafiz of the Qur'an that the book that he had spent five years memorizing was the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hours speaking to this Hafiz, a person who had memorized the Qur'an. So memorization of the Qur'an, Hafiz of Qur'an obviously is extremely important and there's and is a lot of barakah in doing that and we have to do that. But we have to engage substantively with the Qur'an even more. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an do they not have tadabbur? Do they not try to penetrate the meanings of the Qur'an? To have real engagement, deep engagement with the Qur'an. The Qur'an is an ocean. Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says in his Jawahir al-Qur'an, he likens the Qur'an to a bahar, to an ocean. And he says that, uh, obviously, the entire Qur'an is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it has the maqam of a revelation, of a tanzil from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he divides the ayats of the Qur'an into different levels of exaltedness. And he says that, he says, don't be uh, uh, content with walking on the shore and just receiving um, uh, basic meanings of the Qur'an. Basic meanings that we even get in translation. Right? That we need to, we need to plunge into the ocean of the Qur'an. We need to plunge into the logha, the Arabic language. And he actually says that, the waves of the ocean that crash on the shore, these are the Arabic ayat of the Qur'an. So he says we need to get into a vessel, a boat of some sort, and go out into the ocean and negotiate these waves. This is difficult. Learning Arabic is difficult. People try to learn Arabic, and it's like a wave that takes them and smashes them on the shore. But you have to keep trying. And there, this is not to belittle, you know, reading the Qur'an and, and translation and getting something from it. Obviously, people have converted reading the, tra the, the translation of the Qur'an. There was a brother years ago who told me that he went to a bookstore. I think it was a Barnes and Nobles or something. They, they don't, these are dinosaurs now. But he went to one of these bookstores and he was a Christian at the time. And his intention was to go to this bookstore and purchase the Qur'an so he can read it and he can refute it. And he went there and he opened the Qur'an and he looked at the table of contents and he saw Surat Maryam, what is this, Mary? So he started to read it and he said his tears were falling on the pages. Right? This is obviously someone who's reading the Qur'an in a translation. But we have to penetrate the meanings of the Qur'an. So Imam al-Ghazali says the Qur'an is like an ocean. And then he says you get to the, the, uh, the islands and you find what he calls musk meanings. And these are the meanings that are analogous to the ahkam of the Qur'an, the legal injunctions of the Qur'an. And people sometimes, they have this warped idea about what the Qur'an is, even many Muslims. They think the Qur'an is this book of statutes, these do's and don'ts, like what we see in, for example, the, uh, the covenant code in, in, in the Torah or something, or the, the code of Hammurabi or something like that. No, the Qur'an is very different. There are only about 600 ayat of the Qur'an that have legal injunctions, that have ahkam only about 600 ayat. There are over 700 ayat in the Qur'an that command us to reflect and to use our intellects, to use reason. This, this, this uh, kitab, this revelation requires our aql, deep penetrating analysis to understand what this, what this book is saying. It's not a simplistic book. It is not a simplistic book by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. And ulama have spent years and decades 
trying to understand what is this book trying to tell us. And they've classified the different ayat. Some of the ayat in the Quran are khas, meaning they're specific. They're only for a specific time and place. Some of the ayat are am, they're more general. Some of the, the ayat of the Quran are muqayyad, they're conditional upon certain shurud, conditions. Some of the ayat of the Quran, they're mutlaq, they're absolute. This takes deep scholarship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lam Ra, Inna Anzalnahu Quran and Arabian. Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayatu Kitab al Mubin, Inna Anzalnahu Quran and Arabian. La Alukum Taqilun. That, that uh, these are the verses of a book, of a clarifying book. Verily, we sent it down as an Arabic Quran in order for you to intellect, to use intellect as a verb, in order for you to use your intellect, right? It's, it's our intellect interacting with the, with the naql, the, the nas, the text of the Qur'an. This is how we derive meaning from the Qur'an. It's not a simplistic text. And then Imam al-Ghazali says, the highest type of ayat of the Qur'an, he calls them pearl meanings. And these are ayat of the Qur'an that deal with the sirat al-mustaqim. And the greatest uh, uh, exemplar of the straight path is the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the Salat al-Mustaqim according to many of the exegetes. And then you have the ruby verses he calls them of the Qur'an. And these are ayat of the Qur'an that deal with, uh, these are theological verses that deal with the, the essence, the character, the essence, the uh, attributes uh, and the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an extremely deep book that requires deep, deep analysis. So anyway, Ibn Atta'ina Sakandari, he was having some sort of... And by the way, even Imam al-Ghazali, he had a personal crisis. Even Imam al-Ghazali, Hujjatul Islam. And his personal crisis actually was... You know, at one point he was teaching a class. He was a professor at the Nidhamiya in Nishapur. And at one point he got in front of the class and he couldn't even open his mouth. He couldn't make a sound. He couldn't lecture anymore. Because he had this tension within himself. Now, am I doing this with sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is this out of ostentation? So he went on a 10 year long sojourn, right? And eventually he came out of this personal crisis he was having. And he said it wasn't some sort of logical argumentation that took me out of this, but it was a light, it was a nur that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had cast into my heart. It, this doesn't mean that he became a total mystic and an esotericist and things like that. No, he can actually continued to teach. He came back to the uh, to Nidhamiya and he was teaching ilmul kalam. He was teaching dialectical theology. And he said the purpose of that was for rudud, for basically uh, for formulating refutations of, of heretical theological positions. But he said experience is also extremely important. So Ibn Atta'ila Sakandari, he went to his teacher. Uh, Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi, who was a great saint from Morocco, who later moved to Egypt. And he said that the answer from his teacher felt like the, like, like the weight of the earth being lifted from his shoulders. So, uh, he said, al-Mursi, he, he said that the human being is in four states, in, in four conditions. And sometimes you're in all four of these conditions at the same time, but one sort of takes precedence. He said that these four conditions, he said the first one is in a state of blessing. You should rec recognize that you're in a state of blessing, in a state of ni'mah, and that we are inundated with the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, if you just look at um, uh, your health, you have health, you, you have, uh, mashallah, you have wealth, you have your families. Um, you, uh, you have, as our khatib said today, Shaykh Hamza, may Allah preserve him, you have opposable thumbs, you stand upright, you have fingernails, you have toes. These are all ni'm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we don't even think about. So he says, this is the first state, to recognize that you're in a state of blessing. And the response to that is shukr. This should engender a state of shukr within us, a state of gratitude. And shukr is one of the greatest of the theological virtues. So you have cardinal virtues, Ummahatul Fadail, as Imam al-Ghazali calls them in St. Thomas Aquinas. They're the same virtues that actually come from Aristotle. But unlike the Catholics who have three theological virtues, Imam al-Ghazali enumerates uh, up to 19 or 20 theological virtues. And one of the greatest theological virtues is shukr, is gratitude. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions shukr in the Quran many, many times. In shakartum la zidanakum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, if you are grateful, indeed I will increase you. And there's a lot of emphasis, 
grammatically in this statement that if you are grateful, we will increase you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, He doesn't give a, a tamyiz or a specifying element of some sort. Like in another ayah, He says, Rabbi Zidni ilma, oh my Lord, that he's, he's telling us to make this prayer. Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Increase me with respect to knowledge. If you are grateful, I will increase you, presumably, in all good things. So shukur is extremely important to be the shakir and to be shakur. And shakur is the intensive form. The Prophet said, Shall I not be a grateful servant? The shakur is the one who is thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in a time of loss or deprivation. Because he knows, he's wise enough to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be depriving him of something that might actually harm him. So this takes spiritual discipline. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاذْكُرُونِ أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَشْكُرُونِ وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ Have regard for me that I might have regard for you. Be grateful to me and do not disbelieve. Now this is interesting in this ayah, this famous ayah that we all know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is juxtaposing shukur with kufur. That these are antithetical, these are opposites. In other words, another way of saying ingratitude in Arabic is kufr. The kafir is the one who is ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first state we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in a state of blessing. According to Abu Abbas al-Mursi, this is his advice to his student, Ibn Atayl al-Sakandari. And then he says the second uh, state that we find ourselves in is tribulation, bala. And everyone's in a state, in some degree of tribulation. It's part of life in the dunya. Dunya means the low world. Everyone's in a state of tribulation. And the response to tribulation is sabr, is patience. And this is another great theological virtue. That is all over the Quran. Isbiru wa sabiru. Be patient and enjoy patience. Right? Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah is with the patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, indeed we will uh, try you with, with something of, of, um, of, of, of loss of, of, of hunger and fear and loss of wealth and loss of lives and the loss of the fruits of your labor. But give patience to those who are patient. So this is the second state. And then he said, obedience, to recognize that you are in a state of obedience. And the response, the, the response to that is not to gain this type of sanctimonious, holier-than-thou attitude, but to witness the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life, that you make that connection, that the reason why you have tawfiq in your life, the reason why you have health, you have a job, you have a family, the reason why things are working out for you is directly correlated to your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've seen this many, many, many times. People who enter in a state of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their lives start falling apart and they wonder why. And that leads us to the fourth state, which is a state of ma'asiyah, a state of disobedience. And the response to that is tawbah. To make tawbah, to recognize one is in a state of disobedience. And to make tawbah. And Tawbah is a beautiful thing. Tawbah is a great thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at tawab He's the one who's, who's always forgiving. And the Prophet sallallahu he said, At-ta'ibu min dhambihi kaman la dhamba laha wa kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. The one who makes Tawbah is like the one who did not have a sin against him. The Prophet sallallahu says in a beautiful hadith in Bukhari, he says that the similitude of the joy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala experiences when a sinner makes tawbah, and this is a joy that is, that is beyond human comprehension. There's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he says it's analogous to a man who is in the desert with his conveyance, and he's traveling through the desert, and he dismounts from his conveyance, and his conveyance bolts away from him. And now he's walking in the desert, the hot desert, knowing he's going to die an agonizing death. And he's about to collapse and he sees his conveyance under the shade of a tree. And he falls to his knees and he grabs the reins. And he looks up at the heavens and he says, Ya Allah, anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. And he says, Oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. He was so overjoyed, so delirious, in rapturous ecstasy, that he, he lost control of his speech. It's called the shatahiyah. Theopathic utterance that is outwardly wrong because he's delirious with joy. 
This is a hadith the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more overjoyed. In no anthropomorphic way. More overjoyed when a sinner makes tawbah than that man is at that moment. So tawbah, a great theological virtue. Now, just to say a few things about Laylatul Qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. And Qari Umar, may Allah preserve him, he, he told us at the beginning of the prayer that this ayah indicates the inzal of the Quran, the descent of the Quran from the guarded tablet, Lawh al Mahfud, to the Sama'u al Dunya, to Baytul Izza, which is the celestial Kaaba in the first heaven or sky. That's called the inzal. The entire Quran was brought down. And then. From there to the Sama'ud Dunya, the Quran was revealed piecemeal. It's called Tanzil. So there's an inzal of the entire Quran descending and then a piecemeal revelation coming from the Sama'ud Dunya through the agency, the angelic agency or mediation of Jibreel alayhi salam, sometimes through direct, uh, direct discourse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is called the Tanzil. And if you look at the story of the initial revelation that came to him, this is very interesting. There is a, um, uh, a, 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 an agnostic uh, Jewish woman, she's, she's by, by ethnicity Jewish, but she identifies as agnostic, who actually wrote a seerah of the Prophet Her name is Hazelton, uh, that's her last name. The, the text is called, um, uh, it's called um, The Story of Muhammad and she focuses on the, the humanity or the, and examines the sort of psychology of the Prophet ﷺ. It's a good text. And she mentions something interesting. And this is obviously mentioned by many, many traditional scholars before her. But the way she frames it is quite interesting. And she's famous because she's done a lot of TED Talks about the Prophet ﷺ. But it's interesting if you look at the, the story of the initial revelation. So the Prophet ﷺ, around 35 years old or so, he starts experiencing what our mother Aisha said, ar-ru'ya as-sadiqah, true dreams. And the dream of a prophet is the haqq. When a prophet dreams, that's truth. And if you see a prophet in a dream, that's also truth. Especially if you see the Prophet Man ra'ani fil manami, faqad ra'al haqq. In another tradition, man ra'ani fil manami, faqad ra'ani fi'inna shaytana la yatamathalu bi. Whoever sees me in a dream has indeed seen me, shaytan cannot imitate me. So the Prophet ﷺ, he sees true dreams and he starts losing interest in the tijara. So he goes, he seeks khala, seclusion, seclusion. Uh, in uh, Jabal al-Nur, ghar al -Hira, he goes for tahannuth, which has a root meaning of fleeing from idolatry. The Prophet ﷺ was never an idolater. He always worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there were actually a group of, of Meccans, a group of Quraysh in Mecca, that identified as Hunafa, as monotheists. They rejected the idolatry of, of the, or the, the henotheism, a type of polythe, polytheism of the Quraysh in Mecca, and they worshiped the God of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam would go to this cave. Now we know the story that Jibreel alayhi salam, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and he said to him, Iqra, a fi'l amr. This is an imperative. And the Prophet said, Ma'ani biqari. Iqra means read, and he said, I'm not a reader, I'm not a reciter. This happened three times. We know the story. Now what's interesting that's, that's pointed out here in this seerah is that the reaction of the Prophet ﷺ, the reaction of the Prophet ﷺ after this initial revelation that the Prophet ﷺ did not storm out of the cave and float down the mountain, you know, with his chest puffed up and a halo around his head. No, this is not how he came out. The Prophet ﷺ, he was in a state of fear. And he goes to his wife Khadija to Al-Kubra. And he says, Zammi Luni, Zammi Luni, cover me, cover me. He says, Mali, what happened to me? Laqad khashitu ala nafsi. I'm afraid for myself. And Hazelton points out here something interesting about the psychology of the Prophet She says, these are not the confessions of a deceiver. This is not someone who's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. This is someone who's being very sincere. He doesn't know what happened to him. He fears for himself. He wants to know. He asks his wife. 
And his wife says to him, Allah would never ever debase and humiliate you. And she starts naming his virtues. But then she says, I'm not a scholar though. Let's go to a scholar. So they follow the proper protocol. And they go to Waraqa bin Nawfal, who has Christian relative, who is a Christian. The hadith says, Kana rajulan tanassara yaqru al-injila bil arabiyya that Waraqa bin Nawfal, he converted to Christianity and used to read the Injil in Arabic. And he listens to the story of the Prophet ﷺ. And it's a Christian that says to him, that confirms his story, akbar, kama ja ila Musa. This is his diagnosis of what happened. A Christian scholar, that indeed the great Namus, Namus is probably from the Greek nomos, meaning the law of God, or Pneuma, the Holy Spirit of God, the great spirit of God has come upon you, just as it came to Musa alayhi salam. So the Prophet sallallahu his message is something that took the world and lifted it up. And this is something that we have to be cognizant of. Now, something that's very commonly done today is people like to go to certain hadith of the Prophet sallallahu certain one-liners here and there, and wrench them out of context, right? And then try to claim that the Prophet ﷺ, he advocates violence. And this is interesting. You have extremists that identify as Muslims who are doing this, and you also have hardcore anti-Muslim Islamophobes who are doing this. They're quoting the same hadith, and they have the same conclusions that this religion is teaching this type of violence. It's very, very interesting. Two people who are diametrically opposed to each other, yet using the same methodology, right? al ijtiza Their minhaj is, is segmenting the hadith of the Prophet and the Qur'an and taking things out of its siyaq, out of the context of the Qur'an. And just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, but without even looking at context, if I took a statement in English, like, I did not see that, and just, you know, you see that in print, you have no idea how the speaker intoned that statement. Which word did he emphasize? Because it makes a difference. If I say, I did not see that, and I emphasize the first word, I did not see that. Meaning what? You saw that, or he saw that. What if I emphasize another word? I did not see that. This suggests the context that somebody is claiming that I did see something. I'm saying, no, I did not see that. What if I emphasize another word? I did not see that. I heard that. Or I did not see that. I saw this. This is just looking at intonation and, and emphasis. But looking at context is a whole different ball game. This takes deep, deep scholarship. A hadith that is quoted all the time by both sides in this interesting dynamic is a hadith that is a sound hadith in Bukhari, it's in the Arba'een of Imam al nawi which the Prophet ﷺ said, Umirtu an uqatila nasa hatta yashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Now the first thing you do when you hear or read a hadith like this, is you have to check it against the normative ethos of the Prophet ﷺ. The agreed upon ethos or khuluq of the Prophet ﷺ. What is the overarching, uh, uh, um, um, Character, virtue, character of the Prophet, virtue trait of the Prophet ﷺ. It's Rahmah. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Innama uh, mu'allima. I was sent as a teacher. Anna Nabi I am, uh, I am the Prophet of mercy. Innama rahmatun muhda. I am a, a gifted mercy. So it's interesting if you look at this hadith that I, I was commanded to fight, right? I was commanded to fight. Uh, the people until they submit that there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad ﷺ is the messenger of God. The ulama say it's not as simplistic as it sounds, not nearly. That even the word an-nas, used in this hadith, an-nas, which is translated as humanity, it can be, it has different meanings. An-nas can mean humanity at large, right? So, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ nas Nas can also mean a group of people. A specific group of people. In them tafalu wa lan tafalu. Fattakun nar. Alati bukutuha. Annasu wal hijara. 
Produce a sewer like unto this, and if you cannot, and you will not, then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones, humanity and stones. Not everyone, not all of humanity is in the fire. This is obvious. Or a nas can refer to one individual. One individual. There's a verse in the Quran that says that after the, that the context is after the Mujahideen returned from Ghazwat Badr, there was one man, Alladina Qalalahum al Nasu, inna nasa qad jamu alakum fakhshawhum. That there was Nas, but the ulama say this was really just one person named Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud al Ashja'i who said, Indeed, the people are gathering against you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran uses the word an Nas, humanity, the people, to denote one person. So this takes a lot of, this takes deep analysis. And then, umitu an uqatila. Uqatila is form three. Verb form three is not form one, which indicates an associative or engagement. That I've been ordered to, to fight a specific group of people. All of the ulama, most of the ulama say, our, our champion ulama, they say that this refers only to the mushrikeen. And this is engaging with them because they have been engaged with. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ And fight those who are fighting you, but don't be extreme. Allah does not love the extremists. So this is very, very important. That the hadith can be confusing. And you know, I get emails all the time from Muslim youth quoting this and that hadith or quoting this and that verse of the Qur'an. The verses of the Qur'an, they are, they are extremely deep and they require incredible analysis and people don't understand that there's there's different types of 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 of, of, of ways of, of approaching the quranic ayat and there are different shurut of the quran there's the ahkam of the quran they require certain conditions to be fulfilled before they can be enacted they have different mawani they have different preventatives that can prevent them from being enacted so it's important for us to engage in that type of tadabbur with the quran May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to have higher understandings of the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to understand the normative ethos of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He's the one who said, أَحِبَّ لِلنَّاسِ مَا تُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِكِ Here he uses the word nas. أَحِبُّ nas, Love for humanity what you love for yourself. So here in this hadith, love for humanity what you love for yourself, the, the, the meaning of humanity here cannot be the same as أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أُقَاتِ nas. I have been ordered to fight the people. Love for humanity. Do you love to be aggressed upon? Do you love to be fought against? It doesn't make any sense. That's obviously not the meaning. Love for humanity, what you love for yourself. What do you love for yourself? You love for yourself to have a family, to be in, in, in safety and security, to have a job, to have the good things of the dunya, to have the good things of al-akhirah especially. This is what we should love for, for other people as well. This is the normative teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alham